Hey, howdy. Hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Greetings, cretins. <laughs> it's always a joy to see you, John. Ah, thank you very much, Jamilan. Wish I could see your, your happy mug today. Well, let's try. Let's, let's okay. see what happens. I'll, I'll turn it on. We'll see if it, uh, if it starts glitching again or not. I think Brian, that, to a home. Might, yeah. might be better now with, with yeah, just, yeah. we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Um, let's see. A little Q and A today. A little Q and A today. You know, every time I'm with John Blickman, it generally becomes a Q and A session at some point. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots yeah. of questions, lots of answers, um, and a good ninety percent of it has to do with brewing. Uh, the other ten percent, you know, very true. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's always a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of fun hanging out with that guy. I like it. Yeah. Um, I guess the Homebrewers Conference is going to be in Pittsburgh this year, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. That's right. And uh, I'm assuming Mr. John Blickman is going to be there, and he'll have something sure, new and cool to reveal to the brewing world, like he usually does. I'm sure he's yeah. working on something genius. Uh, you can check out all their stuff, uh, uh blickmanengineering.com. They got a great website shows a lot of, a lot of the goodies we're talking about. Um, they've also got the anvil series, which is their more, uh, you know, uh, cost effective, uh, you know, uh, fewer bells and whistles, uh, line, uh, that, uh, they they've got available too. I've got something for everybody. So check them out ask for it at your local homebrew shop, Blickman engineering, innovating your brew day. Great, great stuff. Great people. All right. Uh, we get in questions from y'all. Uh, you can send your, uh, your uh, questions to brewstrong at the brewing network.com and we will eventually get to them. It really yeah. only takes, it only takes a few years. Sometimes it takes a couple of days. Sometimes it takes a decade. Uh, we've been doing this show. Uh, JP was telling me our show in Reno he thinks was our 300th uh, episode of uh, Bruce Strong. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. I guess we have to get at least 65 more of those so people can, you know, do a one a day. Marathon. Yeah, one a yes, day. You could listen to one a day. There you go. Um, I, I think you'd be insane at the end if you listened to one a day, but yeah, it's possible. <laughs> people, people have been, been doing a lot of listening. Uh, just like, uh, 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 just like, uh, what's his name? RJ and Josh. No, the good wrench, uh, out of, out of, out of, uh, Canada. Uh, ah. he wrote to us, uh, in December of 2017 <laughs> oh yeah. yeah he he was he was asking us uh, he says uh, contending with clone recipe hey y'all the recent fuller's episodes were fantastic i've done a clone recipe for stone ruination from mitch Steele's book i'll plagiarize it for reference below i've entered the recipe into beer smith and the estimated uh terminal gravity is 1014 not the 1012 in the book Hey, this is Mitch we're talking about. So I'm going to, I'm not going to doubt his math. <laughs> should I just <laughs> run with it as is, or should I tweak the starting gravity, the OG by reducing base malt, or maybe lower the mash temp to ensure the correct terminal gravity in the software? Or should I edit the attenuation of the yeast in Beersmith? Is there something else that I am missing? Wow. You're overthinking this <laughs> is my, my first thought. Yeah. Um, you know, final gravity can vary a couple, you know, plus or minus two, three, even four points due to a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Pitching rate, temperature, mash temperature, uh, you know, malt, the particular malt that you happen to use mm -hmm. this batch versus the previous batch. All of these can contribute to final gravity variation. So, um, what they're listing in Beersmith is a model. It's a calculation, an estimate. Uh, what Mitch listed in the recipe is probably his own experience with 
his conditions, his yeast, his, you know, tanks. So uh, I really wouldn't worry about it. The, you know, 10, 12 is, is his uh, number. The prediction you got is 10, 14. I wouldn't be concerned if I brewed that recipe and got 10, 16. Um, well, that's you, know, you it, John. You're so, you know, loosey goosey. <laughs> Let the experience wash over you. What about the rest of us that are all panicked about, you know, a single digit uh, being being off or being off by, you know, a hundredth? Well, there's something to be said for consistency. You know, if you, if this is a beer that you're brewing steadily, you know, as a product, then yeah, being the degree, two points off is horrific. Interesting. <laughs> horrific. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I mean, no, that doesn't fly around here. Okay. I well, mean, what, what kind, how high, tightly do you try to hold specs like that on your beers? Oh, dead nuts on. Every okay. Time. That's what I, you, you always, you always, that's what your, that's what your specification is. Okay. Um, yeah. Generally in fermentation, we, we hit the exact same number every time. So sometimes, you know, in the work production side, They'll, you know, be a little low or a little high and they tend to correct that with volume. And then, you know, it tends to be blended batches. So, um, it's not a, not a big deal. The final wort is correct. And then fermentation pH, all that works out. Exactly. We track that because if it's off, then something's going wrong with the yeast. If pH isn't correct, if on a given day, if, if the, if the, uh, specific gravity isn't correct on a specific day. It follows a very rigid, regular pattern every time. And if you if you see that pattern vary, that's a good tip for commercial brewers. You should be checking your pH and your gravity every day on fermentation. And if it starts to, and it, you know, and you let's say the beer works out great and you're happy with it, and then you do it again, and if you see uh, another time that those numbers are varying off of that that uh, uh, numbers that you charted before, then something's gone wrong with the yeast. So it may, you know, maybe you didn't pitch enough. Maybe the yeast is, you know, dying, maybe all sorts of problems, but it's generally a yeast issue. Um, I would say, make sure you're pitching enough yeast, make sure you've, you know, you're supplying oxygen, all that stuff. And you should see the same terminal gravity. Like John was saying, the prediction in uh, Beersmith, it's an excellent prediction, but it's just that it's a model based off of, well, this is what, you know, it should work out to be. But um, I think if you, you'll find that if you replicate the ingredients that uh, Stone uses and you, uh, you know, do good brewing practices, you'll find that you'll, you'll probably hit the, the 10, 12. If you don't, like John's saying, it's not the end of the world. You're probably not going to notice that much difference between 10-12 or 10-14 when you right. taste it. You may like it finishing at 10-14, you know, who knows. But uh, I would just give it a try as is. Just make sure you're, you know, you're brewing as well as Mitch Steele does. And it'll turn out fine. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. Thanks for the question. All right. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. All right, we're back. We're doing uh, some of your questions that you've emailed in over the years. Uh, and if you're listening live, you can ask a question right there in that comment section on Facebook. You type in uh, your questions there. John will, will, will catch those uh, taking place with the lovely Miss Bevo uh, is our own John Palmer. Uh, <clears throat> here is, uh, man, we get, a, we get a lot of listeners in Canada, apparently. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the Bitchin Brewing Co. Uh, Dean, he uh, he was also writing us in uh, August of 2017. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I, I started pulling a lot of 2017. At least I'm not pulling tw you know 2011. Right, presents. right. I mean, I will get to those, but you know, this is going to take a little time. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to write you guys sooner, but I seem to have gotten the gooch while traveling which has reduced me to, well, I think Jamel had the same experience a while back after visiting Singapore. It's amazing how the body can convert even the driest of soda crackers into pure liquid 
<laughs> your liquid evil with minutes. Uh, no longer plagued with riding the porcelain hourly and the, with the ability to stand upright again. Here it goes. I've been brewing hop heavy beers and have been, uh, I have begun bulk buying from a larger Canadian hop supplier to cut cost. So I recently brewed one of my favorite 10 gallon single hop citra bombs using only two hop additions, seven ounce of citra in the 30 minute whirlpool, and then a single four ounce charge of citra in each five gallon carboy for four days at 67 degrees Fahrenheit once fermentation was complete. I had two more ounce of dry hops this time. The hops smelled great before being added and the beer was clean tasting before the dry hop. I did notice a mildly Columbus sort of aroma at this point though. Once uh, tapped a couple weeks later, I was blown away by the dank earthiness of it all. It was a fantastic pungent IPA with a somewhat vegetal hop flavor, but I would be hard pressed to guess that there was any citra in there at all. Did the 2016 crop of Citra change or did someone maybe spill a lot of weed in a pelletizer? <laughs> is this maybe related to the amount I've used or do you think it is something entirely different? Many thanks from Canada, eh, Dean? Um, yeah, the 2016, I can't remember if it was 2016, but yeah, I think the 2016 crop of Citra was not so bueno. Uh, there have been some times when the crop of Citra was kind of off. Um, so much so that people were rejecting some citra back then. Um, and what happens is, you know, it is an agricultural product. And if you have certain, you know, conditions and the environmental conditions change, rain, wind, sun, all that, it can really mess with, you know, the, you know, the, the end product and change it up. Not to say that they're bad hops, but they're different. And they're going to have different oils, different flavors, different aromas. Uh, so you got to be careful when purchasing hops. And what I found, you know, and I think it was maybe around the same time, I was in uh, Sweden and uh, at, a, at a brewer's conference and people had brought beers that they had brewed. And I remember one guy saying, you know, this is 100% Citra IPA. And, uh, I tasted, I'm just like, yeah, that's not Citra. I'm like, are you sure you use Citra? And they're like, well, you know, it comes over from some, somebody who buys it, you know, in the U S and then I'm like, well, what year was it? And they're like, there's no year on it. There's no alpha acid on it. It's just, you know, it just says Citra on it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think people are, you know, packaging up something else and calling it Citra. I, I imagine there could be horrible people doing that, but I just don't think that's very common. And things have improved in Sweden. I know they've gotten, you know, more, uh, you know, direct to the hop suppliers now. Um, mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, once they harvest those hops, even if it, you know, it is Citra, like the, the, the best ones, you know, people go and they smell and they select cuts and then a lot of the rest of it just goes out to everybody else. Uh, you know, you may get something that, you know, is very much like that. So I would say it probably was Citra. It, it probably just was not the best of the Citra crop that year. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. agricultural products. Yeah, all, all hops have picking windows where the growers judge that they've reached their peak flavor and they try to harvest them at that time. But, you know, on any particular farm, you can have issues, whether it's, you know, a different crop that was that, you know, needed to be picked that day that had been too long on the vine, um, you know, other issues, mechanical failures, whatever. But if, in other words, if that hop sits on that vine a day or two longer, the oil uh, uh, changes. The, the amount of oil in the hop gets, get, increases. Um, that oil can aid, that can age and oxidize a bit. So um, even though, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, which I guess what I'm trying to say, Jamil, is that that particular year of citra that you remember, that you know that crop may have suffered from something like that. Maybe it, was, it rained a couple of days that week, and they had to push right. back the, the picking window, and that could have changed the character 
just the uh, availability of labor is causing problems because yeah. it, may, it may mean that they have to pick it a few days later. And I have, um, I've uh, smelled uh, cuts uh, from the same field, essentially uh, one harvested, you know, like two days before and one harvested, you know, two days later, because yeah, the field was so big and they go through picking Sometimes it takes multiple days to complete and just being there an extra couple of days, it was a noticeable difference. It's, it's fascinating how, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of science and a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, artistry that goes into, you know, growing hops and, uh, people do an amazing job of it, but again, agricultural products, you have to kind of be, be wary and and do your own, uh, analysis of stuff. Good question though, Dean. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, The Rev uh, wrote, uh, hi, guys. I love the podcast. I started brewing at the end of the year last year and moved from extract to all grain after a few months of listening to your shows. So this is what we do to people. We end up making them spend money, (laughs) get extra equipment. Uh, My question is this. Lately, after upgrading my mash tun to an 11 and a half gallon got cooler, I keep missing my OG by a lot. They have been around 1030 to 1037 with my all grain recipes. I assume he's probably averaging, trying to get something like a 1055, 1050, yeah. 1060 on most people's beers. So he's getting like, you know, 60%. Yeah. yeah. That. Uh, I have always batch sparged before. I boil the amount needed from beer smith and then mash for 60 minutes, then drain the ton and then add the sparge water. Let it rest 30 minutes, drain it again, then add the final amount of water. Am I adding too much water or is beer smith not working correctly? Thanks for the useful knowledge and can't wait to hear the next show rev. Um, well, I mean, the amount of water should be, you know, the amount you need for that batch of beer. Yeah, uh, I'd make sure that you're adding the correct amount of water that you're not adding mistakenly measuring and adding too much, you know, right. You're measuring your water metric and I <laughs> think it imperial <laughs> you're using inches when you should be using, uh, gallons or something. Mm-hmm. Um, cause the got cooler itself should not cause any problems. Right. And if you are truly batch sparging and truly draining the entire volume, that should take care of any channeling issues or any, you know, preferential extraction. You should be getting, you know, your first runnings depend entirely on your water to grist ratio. So two quarts per pound, one and a half quarts per pound, you should be looking at 1070 uh, uh, gravity on your first runnings. Right. If you take another, you know, half of your boil volume, let's say it's three gallons, four gallons, maybe you're doing a 10 gallon batch, I don't know. But, you know, it it should drop, you know, roughly by half. So um, 1037 sounds real low. And often problems with bad sparging are people not draining completely and leaving a lot of work behind, which then gets diluted and they pull it out and then they try to add more water and to get their volume up. And yeah, they end up with a very diluted word that way. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, you know, instead of adding the final amount of water to the kettle, I mean, it might be worth, you know, just making sure everything's going through the grain. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that, that's gotta be the, the issue that, or, you know, it may be, you know, the grain that he's using the base malt, you know, maybe it's not yeah. being crushed properly. Um, yeah. you know, maybe the grain changed from, uh, you know, malted barley to, uh, painted styrofoam pellets. I mean, yeah. you know, something, I don't know. Um, it could be a very faulty thermometer and he's not hitting sacrificate or, you know, gelatinization temperature. Right, right, right. Um, check your check it. All your measurements you should be measuring everything. 
um, and see uh, what's going on there. Test the first runnings, like John's saying, uh, you know, take some first runnings and see if, uh, you know, what your gravity is there. If that's not up around, you know, 1070 yeah. or higher, then there's something wrong um, with the grain and everything else um, and maybe temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I tell you what, you know, if you went up to uh, Brew Chatter out there, if you lived out near uh, Brew Chatter in Spar the lovely Sparks, Nevada, um, I'm sure they could help you figure this out as well. Uh, great guys, Josh and RJ. Uh, they've got all the equipment there. If, if you need new equipment or you just need to uh, somebody to, to chat with about how to make great beer, those guys know it, and uh, they're wonderful folks. I uh, love those guys up there. Check them out, brewchatter.com. All right. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Michael writes, uh, John picked up the new edition today. He's talking about the how to brew fourth edition. So again, ah. May of 2017. <laughs> <laughs> what are you on edition 36 now? Yeah. Yeah. No, we're still on four. We're still on four. Should be okay, good for so a few more years yet. This is current, current, yeah. current information in my hands. Uh, picked up the new edition today. Super excited to dive into all the new information. Skimmed the brew in a bag se section and saw the stand you made. Can't exactly see how you put it all together, but it looks like a perfect solution. Can you expand on how you join the pieces together? Is it all two by fours? Thanks, Michael. Yeah, yeah, it, it was in fact all two by fours. Um, I joined them into T sections, you know, one one horizontal, one vertical, and secured them with lag screws. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it made a very rigid uh, uh, stand with a, just a hardware hook at the top in the middle that I could lift the bag out and hang it on there and not have to, you know, get my wife to try to hold it up there for the next half hour to, for it to drain. I could just hang it on the hook. There you go. Yeah, lag screws is how I held it together, and that way, I could quickly, you know, take a socket wrench and take it apart to store in the corner of the garage. There you are. All right, good solution. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. All right, we're back. Uh, and don't forget, we're live on Facebook when we do these shows. So you can uh, ask your questions live. You just go on there, Facebook on the Brewing Network page, and then uh, you'll see a little live video and you just click on the comments and you can type in uh, your comments for John and uh, he will read them off. And uh, there you go. All right. Bob's your uncle. I can even keep you up there on local weather conditions. <laughs> Chuck Ferguson reports that it's 20 degrees and there's snow. So. Ah, Chuck. I know Chuck. Uh, when uh, Peter and I, we took the RV from here in California and drove all the way to Minnesota for the conference oh, yeah. in Minneapolis. And we went through uh, Kansas and uh, met up with Chuck, I think, in Lawrence, Kansas, and went to a, a beer thing there. But he very kindly came out to the RV and uh, shuttled us back and forth and, and brought me his barley wine also. Uh, oh. which was quite delicious. Um, yeah. Uh, good old Chuck. I assume that's the same Chuck. Yeah, he says he confirms it, yes. Yes. <laughs> he remembers that, that trip out to, to Minnesota. Nice guy. Yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, out, out in... Uh, in Kansas. That was one of the highlights of the, the trip. We, we went through uh, Denver and all that. That's where I met uh, Chris, Chris Kennedy, who became our first brewer oh, at yeah. uh, Heretic, helped me open Heretic. Uh, and uh, yeah, just a blast. Uh, blast from the past. There you go. Cool. Old man just rambling on about his, his stories. <laughs> Uh, Charlie from Boise, he writes, uh, howdy, howdy. I love Bruce Strong and all the ridiculous tangents, including the Adam and Eve plugs. Well, good for you, Charlie. You can disregard my recipe question about a milk stout recipe back in August. Eh, sorry, I didn't quite get to that yet. 
I have a question about two malts a friend gave me. One is labeled Abbey malt and the other Belgian biscuit malt. I believe both are from more beer and I'm not sure what beer styles other than Belgians I can use them in and what characteristics they will contribute to my beer. Can the Belgian biscuit malt be a substitute for regular biscuit malt? Thank you, Charlie. Abby someone, Abby normal perhaps? Abby normal? That's the <laughs> Abby normal malt, yes. You use it in, in uh, abnormal beers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah well, most of these, yeah, the, 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 you can use these in you know, pale ale, you can use them, it, it doesn't have to be Belgian. Um, I would say if you are trying to craft true, really good Belgian ales, uh, use some Belgian malts that they would use. If you're trying to make a great British ale, use some British malts. If you're making German beers, make German malt. But in the U.S., you can use any malt in anything uh, for, you know, whatever you're making. And it, for a lot of the American styles, uh, you know, a biscuit malt is something that you'll find in a lot of IPAs, pale ales, um, amber ales, uh, yeah, browns, browns, sure. Uh, depends on the color of each. Um, and we uh, should mention that biscuit doesn't mean, you know, biscuits from uh, like your dumplings or something or cornbread things. Or They're talk Yeah. They're talking about cookies, and it's a baked cookie kind of flavor. Um, it's the British use of the word biscuit, not the American use. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, we'll work well in a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Abbey malt, I guess, is uh, probably a melanoidin malt, would you think? Not familiar with those generally. Right. Uh, quite possibly. Uh, might be a crystal malt of some kind. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Sean writes, uh, hi guys, I'm a mechanical engineer and scientifically literate dude. Though most of my background is not in biological stuff as much as basic chemistry, physics, physics, etc., I just finished yeast, and it was a, a fant and it was fantastic. I was wondering if you had a recommendation for two or three more books to delve even deeper into yeast and fermentation, preferably with successive complexity, so I can baby step my way to greatness. By the way, Palmer should release a hip hop album called "Baby Stepping My Way to Greatness." I know uh, he rocketed to fame and fortune, but still <laughs> he's got, uh, he's even got your album art for you. Yeah. That, that was a pretty impressive picture. Um, <laughs> as we all streeted out. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. That's a uh, gold tooth bling and everything. That's funny. <laughs> there you are. Maybe stepping your way to greatness. Yeah. All right, so uh, uh, what 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 books do you do you recommend? You, you, you've got uh, a lot of fermentation. You've got a lot of uh, stuff on the master brewers. Yeah, I would, I would say one of the things to to do is to sign up for a master brewers membership. You can you, you can sign up uh, commercial brewers. You know, you pay one price, but if you're like a student or something like that. They have a nice discounted uh, rate that they that they provide. You don't have to be uh, necessarily in the industry uh, to participate in that. And they have an archive of amazing uh, information, papers, oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, we have a hundred year archive of, of papers, journal articles, um, all about the science of fermentation and practical brewing. Um, I was trying to think of other of yeast and fermentation books i'd recommend um and you're gazing out on the hop field well yeah actually i'm yeah. looking over my bookcase here uh charlie bamforth has several uh good books mm -hmm. um practical guide to fermentation um yeah there's sorry there's a bunch um so yeah some of the some of the more recent books um 
might be something like um, historical brewing practices. You know, if you're interested in Pike yeast, um, Michael Tonsmeyer's American sour beers, you know, if you're interested in sour fermentations. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole slew of good books out there these days. What would you, what, any, any spring to your mind, Jamil? Uh, I'm sure I'll think of 10 after the show's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, let's take one more short break and we'll wrap up, uh, right after this. All right. We're back. Uh, we're doing a uh, live Q and a we're, uh, answering your questions and having a lot of fun. Indeed. Let's see here. All right. Uh, this is a long one. So ah, save good. It for last. Uh, John, uh, don't say where he's from, uh, but John writes, Hey guys, I'll start by saying thank you for everything you do for the community. I'll try to keep it short and include the details in a postscript. Uh, over a year ago, something started going wrong with my IPAs, but not any other styles I can tell. They smell and taste great right after fermentation, but then by the time they have bottle conditioned, all hop and malt goodness have disappeared, leaving a bitter, vaguely sweet brew that is not worth drinking. I don't detect any of the classic descriptors of oxidation, though. I've racked my brain trying to figure this out and have conducted several experiments outlined below that seem to rule out bottling procedure, dry hopping, late hopping, and equipment and water issues. What am I not thinking of? Can a sanitation problem only affect hoppy beers? Maybe something involving the yeast? I don't have a meter to read my pH. Could that be the issue? Please help. You're my only hope. Thanks, John. Interesting. Uh, a bitter, slightly sweet. Um, yeah, I mean, that to me, me you know, means oxidation or staling. Um, you know, the only other thing I can think of is maybe, you know, some, you know, diacetyl production or, you know, contamination yeah. of some kind. Um, he says it only it, seems to affect his IPA. That's odd. This typical IPA recipe would include mostly two row or Maris Otter and maybe a little wheat. 60 minute rolling boil with a bittering charge of 40 IBUs or so at the beginning. Within the last 20 minutes or shortly after, I'll throw in a bunch of hops approaching one ounce per gallon and dry hop with an equal amount. Sometimes I've been careful to keep the break out of the fermenter, and sometimes most of it goes in. Once cooled to the mid-60s, pitch some WLP-001 or 007 from a starter or rehydrated Safale 05, then ramp a few degrees as fermentation slows. Oh, that sounds fine. Yeah. He says yeah. he's also tried... Uh, He's brewed an all extract batch to rule out a problem with the mash. Okay. Did a split batch, well, bottled one, left one in the fermenter. He did a split, split batch, one dry hopping, one not. He brewed a recipe without any hops, boiled for the, less than 20 minutes. He used a hop spider to cut down on hop material in the fermenter. Brewed using different equipment. Brewed using filtered tap water with and without mineral and acid additions. Brewed with RO water plus salts and acid. Currently seeing if my long abandoned practice of using a secondary fermenter may have somehow helped me from avoiding this in the past. Hmm. So well, hmm. yeah, oxidation seems like a good first mm -hmm. guess to me as well. Um, oxidation from say the headspace of the keg, if he's kegging, you know, can it can strip hop aroma pretty quickly in some beers, especially when you're expecting it, you know, and you and it's not to the level you expected. Um, I also wonder about diastaticus because that can ferment out a lot of the flavor out of a beer pretty quickly fairly rapidly it doesn't it doesn't affect the flavor that much it'll, it'll really thin it out yeah dry it out you know and he didn't mention gushing or over carbonation so okay. maybe not that but if it's kegged 
a lot of times people don't notice that true pulling off pints yeah um but i would think um you know that's one of the things you know the the descriptors for oxidation we gotta get away from talking about papery cardboard all that that's that is you know when you're one. dealing with really light lager, light, you know, adjunct heavy beers, um, you might get that. But when you're dealing with most craft beer, um, you know, where there's a lot more, uh, you know, melanoid and rich flavor and all that, it tends to be more of like a caramel, you know, kind of an oddly sweet caramel character. Mm-hmm. Toffee. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's usually one of the things I think, you know, people miss, uh, you know, as, as oxidation, and that's the most common kind of flavor and it will have a bit of that sweetness. <laughs> um, I mean, pH can affect things, but, uh, you know, it's probably not the issue. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. I mean, oxidation or contamination seems like. The most likely thing to me. Yeah. Now we mentioned sweetness too, mm-hmm. and I have had IPAs where, due to hop creep, they mm-hmm. were get uh, off the yeast. They were getting sweetening of the beer uh, mm-hmm. with time. Right. And and that's that can be a strange phenomena where your IPA keeps getting sweeter with time. Um, well, and that's why I was also thinking maybe you know, some diacetyl. Yeah. You know, because that buttery flavor can kind of make it can it can mute the the hops and you know provide some slickness and some kind of almost sweetness. That's true. As well. Yeah. Yeah. That that could be part of it. That's yeah, true. and and of course, oxidation could be in combination with that. You know, a little oxygen, a little more hop creep more diacetyl production, loss in hop aroma plus increase in in sweetness or, or diacetyl change in flavor. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, what would you do at this point to kind of narrow down the problem? What what uh what action should he take? Uh hmm. well uh purging of the headspace and the keg to minimize potential oxidation right. um watch your transfers keep yeah. everything take cold. a take a sample of the as fermented beer and chill it and keep it very very cold um for a period of weeks and see if that flavor changes compared to the main batch because if it's oxidation related, chilling it down will retard that. If it's hop creep related, chilling it down will retard that. Uh, that'd be one way to kind of narrow the field, I think. Yeah, you do that. You could try doing a, a force ferment too. Yeah. Uh, if that exhibited changes it much comes more on quickly. quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd also check, check the, the gravity when you, before you package it. And then later on, when you experience this problem, yeah. check the gravity again and see yep. if it's changed, uh, considerably. Um, I mean, one other potential possibility is, uh, you know, maybe just some of the hop compounds are dropping out. Mm-hmm. I mean, bittering will drop like 50% yeah. over the course of a few months. Yeah. Different, different hop batches may make a difference as well. True. Um, so, you know, if he's been pulling his IPAs from one big bag this whole time, that could be the cause could be that particular batch of hops he's using. Right. I mean, he says they, it smells and tastes great right after fermentation. Mm-hmm. But by the time they have bottle conditioned, I'll hop them all. Goodness, it disappeared. Yeah, hop and malt 
I mean, I can see one or the other typically, but having both disappear is unusual. Well, maybe like you're saying, diastaticus. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, it doesn't affect the flavor that much, but it can really thin out a beer. Yeah. When I've had diastaticus in the past, I mean, it'll, I've had beers that ended up tasting like club soda. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, but almost all the malt character goes away. And I've, I've tasted that in competition too. Right. Um, so yeah, then I think one of the first things to do is to ensure that <coughs> you're working sanitary. I would, uh, you know, give everything a good hot clean, uh, you know, look for scratches and things like that that may be harboring uh, bacteria or yeasts. Um, you know, resanitize everything. Just make sure you're, you know, get rid of your plastic tubing and stuff like that. Check uh, your ball valves. Check your ball valves. Yeah. Uh, you know, snap yourself off a fresh piece of tubing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, ball valves is another good point. I used to take my ball valve off of my kettle and put in a little pot of water and boil it for a few minutes. Um, just so. You know, a lot of times the valve will get hot enough just through conduction with the, with the kettle. But uh, if you're using any ball valves, good idea. And when you clean them, you open the valve just partway. You know, it's, it's uh, like kind of midway because there's the pocket that the ball rotates in. If you have the ball valve completely open or completely closed, those pockets are not getting uh, cleaned out or exchanged. So you got to right. do it partially open. Um, okay. Other thoughts for him. I really want to help this, this, this poor guy. Uh, yeah. that's, yeah. That, that's all I keep coming back to is it's either oxidation or contamination of some kind. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe you're right with diastaticus. Yeah. Hop creep shouldn't affect the malt flavor much. And you, you could see it, as you said, by checking the final gravity at bottling right. and then like a couple weeks yeah. later you can expect a maximum i think of like four gravity points change in an extreme case um but two gravity points change in final gravity could be more indicative for you know uh, i could could still be hop creep generating some extra sweetness mm. right okay well, there you go. Uh, you have any questions from the? Uh, nope, no, no chat? new ones there. There you go. I think Craig Chuck was our only listener. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was Brian and Michael. Yeah, no, uh, they haven't. They haven't thought of any questions. I guess <laughs> they're just happy to be here. That's all right. Everybody got like five minutes notice that we were doing this. So there you go. Well, I certainly had fun. I hope you did Me too. too. If, if you're listening live, stay tuned. John and I are going to do a third episode. Yes? Right. We're going to get a whole bunch of water questions in the next hour. Yes, it's going to be all water all the time uh, in the next section. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, we're, we're trying to get caught up and be be good good, good podcasters and not be behind. Right, right. You know, so yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. Uh, <clears throat> make sure you check out our, our great sponsors, uh, Blickman Engineering, BlickmanEngineering.com. Uh, you can even send an email to John Blickman at uh, feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Those go direct to him, and you can tell him how much you, you, you think of him sponsoring the show. Um, hopefully good stuff. Uh, so yeah. he keeps paying for it like he has for the last 300 shows. Uh, it'd be good to, good to keep him on there. Uh, and check out their, their wonderful stuff at, at your homebrew shop, at the conference, and online, you can see all that. The Anvil series, the, the Blickman Engineering series, the top tier series, all that stuff. Great equipment, innovating every day. And check out our, uh, our friends at uh, Brew Chatter, brewchatter.com out in Sparks, Nevada. Good folks, RJ and Josh. Uh, really fun uh, folks with a lot of brewing knowledge and uh, a great shop as well. 
Until then, everybody, Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong. <laughs>